7. As we come to the next section of Paul's letter to Timothy. And what we've been considering is faithfulness. Faithfulness as a church. And so the question comes to us, how might we determine faithfulness? How do we identify someone as faithful or unfaithful? A church as faithful or unfaithful? It is important to be reminded that faithfulness is always attached to action. That's what we must keep in mind. It is lived out in plain view. Uh, We don't label faithful that which is unseen. Uh, You can think of it even in the culture. We think of faithfulness in terms of marriage, right? Think of how we identify a faithful spouse. They are those that are devoted to the needs and the desires, the interests, the care, the protection, the reputation of their spouse. And that devotion is seen. It's tested in actions and words spoken to and about that spouse. And we wouldn't call faithful a spouse whom we don't know and observe. We couldn't make that determination. It would be an empty identification. And so pursuing faithfulness and supporting the truth of the gospel, which is what we've been looking at in this letter, is the theme. And so a church that wavers in that faithfulness will face disaster. That's what we're going to try to keep ourselves from is that disaster. And so a church will cease to be a church. Those members are at risk of apostasy and damnation. And that church's gospel light is snuffed out if they pursue unfaithfulness. So if we pursue faithfulness, we must know what faithfulness looks and sounds like. The consequences of unfaithfulness are ultimate. And so the church in Ephesus was being encouraged by leaders and false teachers among them to unfaithfulness to the gospel of Jesus Christ. And so the first activity that we looked at last, uh, the last two weeks that Paul instructs Timothy and the church in Ephesus to undertake is loving instruction. That loving instruction that would ensure faithful support of the truth of the gospel. Faithfulness shows itself in active and loving instruction. It doesn't stay silent. It's not tolerantly putting up with false teaching, but it's lovingly confronting, actively loving through faithful instruction. And in chapter 2, verses 1 to 7, we find the second activity that ensures a faithful support of the truth of the gospel, which is prayer. So follow along as I read verses 1 to 7. Paul says, First of all, then, I urge that entreaties and prayers, petitions and thanksgivings be made on behalf of all men, for kings and all who are in authority, so that we may lead a tranquil and quiet life in all godliness and dignity. This is good and acceptable in the sight of God our Savior, who desires all men to be saved and to come to the knowledge of the truth. For there is one God and one mediator also between God and men, the man, Christ Jesus, who gave himself as a ransom for all, the testimony given at the proper time. For this I was appointed a preacher and an apostle. I am telling the truth, I am not lying as a teacher of the Gentiles in faith and truth. So in our corporate worship, our gatherings, how do we demonstrate a faithful support of the truth of the gospel in our prayer? That's what Paul has in mind here. In our corporate worship, how do we support a faithful defending of the truth of the gospel in our prayer? What kind of prayer will demonstrate faithful support of the truth of the gospel? What are those qualities of corporate prayer that best express and demonstrate a faithfulness to the gospel? I want us to notice four qualities. Four qualities of corporate prayer that ensure faithful support of the truth of the gospel in our corporate worship. These four qualities of corporate prayer demonstrate a faithful congregation in supporting the truth of the gospel. So we must examine our corporate prayers And see, are they marked by these four qualities that ensure faithful support of the truth of the gospel in our corporate worship? So the first quality, first quality of corporate prayer that ensures faithful support of the truth of the gospel in our corporate worship, these prayers are those that are comprehensively focused. They're comprehensively focused. That's what the first two verses 
here in 1 Timothy 2 would have for us to see. First of all, then, I urge that entreaties and prayers, petitions and thanksgivings be made on behalf of all men, for kings and all who are in authority, so that we may lead a tranquil and quiet life in all godliness and dignity. If you look back at the verse 1 there, the then that we see in verse 1 is actually in the Greek text, the first word of the sentence, and it stands for therefore. All that is about to be said is related to what has just been instructed. That loving instruction, all that we see in those passages on faithful, loving instruction is related to what we're just about to see in corporate prayer. Because faithfulness is being challenged by false teachers and waywardness is being encouraged, now in light of the activity of loving instruction, we should turn our attention to how we encourage faithful support of the gospel in our corporate worship, in our prayers. In fact, chapters 2 and 3 are centered around the activity of worship in our gathering. Within the gathering, these activities are those that would most pursue a faithful support of the truth of the gospel. That's why Paul uses the phrase, first of all. First of all then. He doesn't have in mind necessarily just what is said first, but this is a corrective. This activity should find the greatest importance in our mind as a body about what is being said in the next several chapters on corporate worship. This activity, this activity of corporate prayer will be of first importance. Of all that will be said about the activities in our worship gatherings, this should be of highest priority. In fact, he prioritizes even further, and it's strengthened by the phrase, I urge. So this is not just merely a suggestion that Paul has in mind. It's not just a possibility but this is an exhortation that Paul has for the church. What is to follow must be of the highest priority. If we are to ensure faithful support of the truth of the gospel in our corporate worship, do not ignore what is being said. In fact, the, the tone of this exhortation is, is, it's not a bark, it's not just a mere cold order. If, if, for those of you who are parents, this would have the tone of that you're just urgently, seriously pleading with your children. You're, you're saying, look at me. Look at me. I want you to take in this instruction that I'm about to give you. I want you to look at me. Don't miss the instruction that you need to hear. That's what Paul is urging the church. So what is a first priority? What are we not to miss? That entreaties and prayers and petitions and thanksgivings be made on behalf of all men. If, if we are to faithfully support the truth of the gospel in our corporate worship, we are to give priority to prayer. And, and Paul here, he doesn't just say any kind of prayer, one kind of prayer. Look back at the text. We're to make entreaties and prayers and petitions and thanksgivings. It's, it's as if Paul pulled up his scroll application and he right-clicked on the word prayer and he went to the synonym tool and he said, I'll take them all. He said, I want you to pray in all of these kinds of ways. We're to make every kind of prayer. And, and what he has in mind here is not just a checklist of I prayed this kind of prayer and prayed this kind of prayer. But he has in mind a comprehensive way that we as a church are to pray to God. We are to make sure that our prayers are not one-dimensional. We must be careful that we're not stuck praying in only one kind of way. But we're to pray in every way. We're to plead before God. We're to list needs. We're to express reliance upon the only one who can supply. We're to intercede for others. We're to earnestly ask. This list even encourages the kind of prayer that expresses thanks to God. A thanksgiving that we trust in all that God has done, we confidently anticipate what he will do. That kind of thanksgiving. And notice also that these comprehensive types of prayers have a comprehensive focus. We plead and we intercede and we ask and we express thanksgiving on behalf of whom? All men. All men. These expressions of prayer on behalf of others uh, should not be seen as a, a bit more focused, but just a praying for others. That's not what Paul has in mind here. Not just a praying for others. But Paul says to the church, he's exhorting the church to pray not just for them, but on behalf of. This should give us a bit of a clue of the main purpose of these prayers. 
We pray on behalf of those who can't or won't or don't pray for themselves. We pray comprehensively on behalf of all. This is a glimpse of the gospel focus that these prayers will have, as we'll see in full in verses 3 and 4. Uh, so these comprehensive prayers are to expressed on behalf of comprehensive humanity. Comprehensiveness, in fact, is a theme throughout this whole passage. Look back at the passage as a whole, all seven verses. In verse 1, all kinds of prayers are to be offered on the behalf of all people. And as we'll get to, all who are in authority in verse 2. Uh, the outcome of these prayers is that we may lead a life in what? All godliness. In verse 4, it is God's desire that all men be saved. In verse 6, that the man Jesus Christ gave himself as a ransom for all. We shouldn't miss that Paul is urging prayers with a universal focus. There's no type of person, person that is excluded from our prayers. Uh, we pray on behalf of those among us. We pray on behalf of our families, our fathers and mothers, sons and daughters, brothers and sisters, nieces and nephews, aunts and uncles, all of those in our family. We pray on behalf of our co-workers, all of them. None are to be excluded. We pray on behalf of our neighbors, fellow soccer moms, classmates, grocery store clerks, bank tellers, pet groomers, doctors, lawyers, gay rights activists, pro-abortion activists, pro-life activists, the homeless, the poverty stricken, uh, stricken, the uber wealthy, CEOs, and on and on and on. <laughs> Who do we not pray for? No one. We pray for all. We pray on behalf of all people in our nation, all people in other nations, all people around the world. As comprehensive as you can make the list, we should be praying on behalf of all people. In fact, Paul strengthens this even further when he says that not only are we to pray for all people, but we're also to pray for kings and all who are in authority. He's, it's essentially as if he's saying, by the way, when I say the term all, it doesn't exclude those who are in authority over us. And in fact, if you think back to Paul's day, the church was to pray on behalf of the local governors, the Roman occupying forces. Ultimately, he was saying that even prayers on behalf of the emperor are to be made. Yes, that emperor who was killing Christians, who was torturing Christians, accusing Christians, persecuting Christians, and encouraging all to do the same. Yes, pray on behalf of him. We're to pray on behalf of all of those in authority over us. Our, our city council members, our mayor, our municipal judges, county commissioners, and on and on. I don't need to list them all. I have them all listed here, but I won't get into those. I think you get it. Those from every political party, every social agenda, every fiscal camp, and on and on. And if you find yourself saying, but what about, or he can't mean, I think you've missed it. Who is to be excluded? Who can we get away with missing? No one. Paul means all. All means all here. Now please recognize that Paul does not have in mind that in our church gatherings that we should have some kind of worldwide phone book and be systematically waking, making our way through it in our corporate prayers. Yet, if we laugh and scoff at the sheer absurdity of that thought, I think we've missed the point too. Do we cozy up to the absurdity of that approach because we want to give some means, some excuse for shying away from including some in our prayers? Who might we have particularly difficult time praying on behalf of? Who might we have an aversion to pleading to the Lord for? Who comes to mind that petitioning and giving thanks to the Lord for would be radically different, difficult? I think those are the very ones that we should be praying on behalf of first and most. Because why would we exclude them? What would motivate that exclusion? If we find it easy to not pray for some, you may be fleeing from a confident understanding of God and a life lived in faith. And so while the, the content of these prayers on behalf of all people is found in verses 3 to 4, we do see a purpose a purpose for these prayers and entreaties and petitions and thanksgivings. 
Look back at the text. The purpose is seen in so that we may lead a tranquil and quiet life in all godliness and dignity. Now, don't misunderstand. We, we don't pray in this way so that we will have lives free from conflict. That's not, what Paul, that's not what Paul is meaning here. It's not a plea for a carefree and fancy-free kind of life. That's not the point. But we are to pray on behalf of others, even those in authority, so that we would be those marked by lives of tranquility and quietness and godliness and dignity. Praying in this way leads to a life that is undeniable to others. It's observably quiet and peaceful. We are not those to be known as unruly and restless, rebellious and uneasy. Do you see how that observable kind of life is cultivated by a, a focus on the spiritual state of others? If we're pleading before God for one who is radically opposed to God, and all we understand and love in the gospel and the truths that we hold dear because they are the truths of God, if we're fervently, genuinely giving thanks on behalf of them to a merciful, gracious, and holy God, that kind of prayer, that will begin to foster in us a life of quiet and peace. Because we recognize our inability and we highlight God's sufficiency. One commentator describes this as, a life free from the hassles of a turbulent society. Not a life free from turbulence, but from the hassles of that turbulence. It's as if we don't have a grip, we don't have to grip the armrests of life with restlessness and unease. We can have confidence in the midst of all of the chaos around us because we know who is sovereignly guiding and determining the outcome. So if you look back at this verse, This tranquil and quiet life is particularly marked by a comprehensive godliness and dignity. A life that is tranquil and quiet is particularly characterized by our godliness and dignity. One commentator describes a godly life as totally consecrated to God, to his worship, and to the fulfillment of his will. That's what a life that is lived for God looks like. It's to live as God would have us to live. Now that's contrasted significantly with the asceticism of these Ephesian false teachers. And Paul later in verse, uh, chapter 4, verse 7 of this letter exhorts us to have nothing to do with the worldly fables fit only for old women. On the other hand, discipline yourself for the purpose of what? Godliness. Godliness is profitable for all things, Paul says, since it holds promise for the present life and also for the life to come. But not only is this tranquil and quiet life marked by godliness, but it is one that is dignified. It is one that is of dignity, a seriousness and solemnity and disciplining oneself in godliness. We as a church ought to be identified by our tranquil and quiet lives that is lived in all godliness and dignity. A church that gives priority to comprehensively praying on behalf of all people, it, that kind of church is a church that confidently and faithfully lives without fear, without anxiousness, but lives in godliness and dignity. So the first quality of corporate prayer that ensures faithful support of the truth of the gospel in our corporate worship is a comprehensive focus. A comprehensive focus. All kinds of prayers on behalf of all kinds of people leading to a life in all godliness and dignity. Comprehensively focused prayers. A second quality of corporate prayer that ensures faithful support of the gospel in our corporate worship is that they are gospel-centered. Gospel-centered. If the focus of prayers on behalf of all people is comprehensive, the content is gospel-centered. Why pray all kinds of prayers for all kinds of people? Because it is God's desire that they should be saved. Look back at the text in verses 3 and 4. This is good and acceptable in the light of God, our Savior, who desires all men to be saved and to come to the knowledge of the truth. What is good and acceptable? That entreaties and prayers, petitions and thanksgivings be made on behalf of all men. We pray in these ways for all people because it is good and acceptable to God and his will that all come to salvation. 
Paul is purposefully using sacrificial language here to describe a right action and service. He's putting it in terms that these false teachers in church were wrestling through. And he's using language that they would have had in Deuteronomy 6.18. Thinking of right worship. You shall do what is right and good in the sight of the Lord. Or in fact, in the book of Leviticus, right sacrifices are described as acceptable to God. In the Old Covenant worship of God, sacrifice was central to worship. It was that which was good and acceptable to God. And so for us, prayer on behalf of all people, especially those in power, is central to a right and faithful worship. It is good and acceptable to God, the God who is our Savior, the means and source of salvation. It's also central to right worship because prayers offered on behalf of all people for salvation align with God's will that all be saved and come to the knowledge of the truth. We are to pray for all because salvation is for all. As one commentator puts it, God's universal intention for all to be saved. So those lists that we went through on who we are to pray for, it is God's desire for all of them to be saved, all people. The gospel is not exclusive of anyone. It's not a narrow gospel. It is a gospel for anyone and everyone. A salvation marked by coming to the knowledge of the truth. To be saved is to be fully discerning and to taking on as your own the whole of the revelation of God in Jesus Christ. Those who are in the truth know God. And as Paul advocated in these pastoral letters, they are those that oppose false myths and they protect the truth of the gospel. This isn't just a generic understanding of all that is or that can be true. That's what Paul has in mind here when he talks about truth. Though it certainly doesn't stand opposed to general truth. But this is a reference to the understanding of the truth of God that brings about salvation. We pray on behalf of all people with full confidence and knowledge and hope that we pray to the God who saves and desires for all to be saved. Uh, now I do need to address, I'm sure it's on your mind, that Paul, is, is Paul teaching universalism here? Is, is Paul saying that we pray on behalf of all people because God will save all? Simply put, no. I, I can't unpack all that could be said, but a faithful understanding of Paul's purpose here and in the broader context of Scripture, no. There is no universal salvation. Particularly in passages such as Matthew 24 clearly show that not all will be saved. Not all will come to the knowledge of the truth. So if not all will be saved, is God impotent to carry out his desires of salvation for all? And if he isn't impotent, he's, he's not by the way, um, how do we reconcile these seeming contradictions? First, in the context of this passage and elsewhere in Paul's writings, it's clear that Paul is stressing the universality of the gospel offer. We sin in withholding the gospel from any, from anyone. It's a free offer to all. And Jesus Christ is available to all peoples without distinction. For there's no Jew, there's no Greek in Christ. God desires all to be saved. Second, as one commentator states, perhaps we can make a theological distinction between God's revealed will that all should be saved and God's secret will that only certain purses, persons should be saved. And we in our finite minds are not called upon to discern or discover the latter. But we operate willingly and obediently in the former. So prayers that give faithful support of the truth of the gospel in our corporate worship will be those that are comprehensively gospel-centered. Prayers on behalf of all people for salvation, that they come to the truth of the knowledge, uh, to the knowledge of the truth as God desires for all people. So the first two qualities of corporate prayer that ensures faithful support of the truth of the gospel in our corporate worship, they are, have a comprehensive focus and they are gospel-centered. A third quality of this kind of corporate prayer is that they are God-enabled. They're God-enabled. God in himself is the means 
by which all are saved. So we pray for the salvation of all, as aligns with the desire of God that all be saved, knowing that salvation is a work and purpose of God in Christ Jesus. Look back at verses 5 and 6. For there is one God and one mediator also between God and men, the man Christ Jesus, who gave himself as a ransom for all, the testimony given at the proper time. There is one God, one God for all people. God is the universal Savior for all, is highlighted here. There are not multiple gods for multiple people. And in fact, that's even pushed a little further when he says there's one mediator also between God and men. There's one mediator. Just as there's one God, there is one means by which God and all people are reconciled. There are not multiple gods. There are not multiple means of reconciliation. That is why we pray for all people. It is God's desire that all be saved, and there is one God and one mediator, and all are united together under that one God and reconciled by that one mediator. To refuse to pray for some would be to deny the unity of God and the sufficiency of the one mediator. The universality, the comprehensiveness of our corporate prayers is further highlighted. We pray for all peoples to be saved by the one God and mediator because they have no other means by which to be saved. Paul furthers this for us in describing the person and work of the one mediator. That one mediator is the man, Christ Jesus. He is the man, Christ Jesus. This perfectly describes the only one who could mediate between sinful man and a holy God. He is both man and God. The mediator is man. He is the one who took on flesh. He is the one who sympathizes with our suffering because he also suffered. He is man. But the mediator is also Christ, the Messiah, who was anticipated, who was longed for, God become flesh, the very Son of God, God himself incarnate. This one who is both God and man stands perfectly between sinful men and holy God. He mediates and reconciles between us. Second, the one mediator gave himself as a ransom for all. Look back at verse 6. The text says, who gave himself as a ransom for all. The mediation was accomplished by the ransom payment of Christ. Bearing the wrath of God for all, this ransom is effective to any kind of person. We pray on behalf of all people because this man, Christ Jesus, the one mediator between one God and sinful men, gave himself as a ransom for all. None are excluded. His ransom payment is not exclusive. It doesn't exclude any based on who they are or how egregious their sin. It's hard to know exactly what the last phrase means and what it's referring to, the, the testimony given at the proper time. The proper time is used later in this letter to refer to Christ's second coming being manifest at the proper time. And then in Titus 1-3, where God brought about salvation through his word at the proper time, I think proper time just is a synonym for God's time. The time he deemed appropriate. But the difficulty arises in what is meant by testimony. Uh, some attach the testimony to the mediating work of Christ in verses 5 and 6, and some to the final work, verse, the testifying work of Paul as herald and apostle. It seems better to me to attach it to the meaning of the testimony in Christ. The redeeming work of Christ as ransom and mediator is the testimony given at the proper time. He came and enacted the new covenant when God had predetermined to be good and right. So we pray on behalf of all people for salvation because God desires all to be saved and he and his son are the exclusive means by which any are saved and all are saved that come to the knowledge of the truth. If we desire to faithfully support the truth of the gospel in our worship, we will pray fervently for all. Knowing salvation is God-enabled, our prayers are effective because our petition is to an effective God. We do not fear that any are beyond the saving work of God. We do not hedge on who we pray for because we trust in the salvific work of the one God, the one mediator, Christ Jesus. Our prayers that ensure a faithful support of the truth of the gospel in our corporate worship are comprehensively focused, they're gospel-centered, they're God-enabled, and finally, 
They're mission clarifying. Mission clarifying. Why should our corporate prayers be comprehensively focused and gospel-centered and trusting in God's enabling work in the gospel? Because those are the very marks of our gospel mission. When we pray in this way corporately, we demonstrate together the mission to which we were called, the desire for the nations to be in Christ. We trumpet our confidence in the heralding of the gospel. That's what Paul is helping us see. Why urge this kind of corporate prayer is of first importance? We'll look back here at verse 7. For this, I was appointed as a preacher and an apostle. I am telling the truth, I am not lying. As a teacher of the Gentiles in faith and truth. For this gospel, for the saving work of God our Savior who desires all to come to be saved, the mediating work of God through Christ Jesus, the ransom payment for our sin, to this Paul was appointed. He was set apart by God. And if he didn't make this calling of himself, but he was appointed by God as a preacher and an apostle and teacher of the gospel. He was appointed by God to proclaim and to herald and preach the good news of Jesus Christ. He was appointed by God to an apostleship for the church, to protect her and guard her. He has been given authority to lead the church. He was appointed by God as a teacher. His teaching is faithful and true. His teaching is reflective of his character. And in fact, he stresses the veracity of this appointment by affirming the truthfulness of what he's saying. He's saying, I'm I'm telling the truth. I'm not lying. One commentator says that the affirmation underlies the certainty of what Paul is asserting to be his mission. His mission is clear. It is certain and firm. And Paul indicates the benefactors of his missional appointment. He says that he is apostle and teacher and preacher to the Gentiles. So if Paul was, what Paul was saying is true, and he was appointed to a mission to the Gentiles, why should the church exclude them from their prayers and fellowship? If, the God, desires, if God desires all to be saved and has demonstrated that fact by appointing Paul to a mission to those previously thought excluded, then why keep excluding them By extension, if we mind our prayers, if we have in mind our prayers that plead for the salvation of all people to a God that desires for all to be saved and provides the means for that salvation by himself, how can we not but be comprehensive in our prayers? Our missional focus is to all peoples of the earth. No one is excluded. No one is denied. No one is left out. No one is too far gone. These comprehensively focused, gospel-centered, God-enabled prayers provide missional clarity for us in our worship gatherings. God's mission for us is all people. And we pray for all people because that is our mission. If we desire to ensure faithful support of the truth of the gospel, these are the four qualities that must mark our prayer in our corporate worship. Our corporate prayer must be comprehensively focused, gospel-centered, God-enabled, and mission-clarifying. I want to close by asking us to just think through some implications. Some implications of this for our corporate prayers. In our prayers, do we show a lack of confidence in the truth of the gospel? By that I mean, do we knowingly or unknowingly exclude some from our petitions and treaties just because of who they are? or what they've done, or how they've led, whether we think they'll repent and believe. Are our prayers continually saturated with a gospel focus? Do we really desire for those opposed to the truth of God and the goodness of Christ to be saved? Or do we secretly harbor doubt? Do we lack compassion? Or just do we not understand our mission for all peoples? Do we offer anemic, lifeless, unexpectant prayers for the lost? And if we do, what does that reveal about what we believe about God and his desires? How can a robust understanding of God's desire to save the lost 
and the reality of the salvific, sacrificial, mediating, redemptive work of his son transform how and what we pray together. We, we faithfully support the truth of the gospel when we pray in these ways together. I, I came across a poem this morning, and I, I thought it summarized well this kind of prayer. It's a, a poem by Newman Hall, and it says, We pray for those who do not pray, who waste away salvation's day. For those we love who love not thee, our grief, their danger, pitying see. Those for whom many tears are shed and blessings breathed upon their head. The children of thy people save from godless life and hopeless grave. Hear fathers, mothers as they pray, for sons, for daughters far away. Brother for brother, friend for friend, hear all our prayers that upward blend. We pray for those who long have heard, but still neglect thy gracious word. Soften the hearts obdurate made, by calls unheeded, vows delayed. Release the drunkard from his chain, bear those beguiled by pleasure vain. Set free the slaves of lust and bring back their home the wandering. The hopeless cheer guide those who doubt, restore the lost, cast no one out. For all that are far off we pray since we once were far off as they. Let's pray together. Father, reveal in our hearts inclinations of retreat from your mission. Reveal in our hearts a lack of desire for the salvation of all. Show us where we think we know better who you'd prefer in your kingdom. Break any desires to be exclusionary in our prayers and compassion for the lost. We ask that you use us as messengers of the gospel with our families, our neighbors, and co-workers. Bring them to understand their sin. Break down the prideful sin of self-reliance or self-love. Open their eyes to the truth of the gospel. Father, we pray fervently for all those in authority over us those in the workplace and in government, we thank you for them. You have been gracious to provide them for our protection, for our care, for our good. We thank you for your sovereign goodness in their leadership. We pray that they would come to see that you have put them in those areas of authority, that you are God. May you be to them a savior. May they come to the knowledge of the truth that you, through the work of your Son, Christ Jesus, have mediated the way of salvation. You have given yourself in the person of your Son as a ransom to pay the wrath that they deserve. We beg that they would come to call you Lord. Father, may we recognize that you have placed us in this place at this time with the unbelievers in our lives for a distinct purpose, that we might proclaim your goodness, your grace, and your mercy in Christ. Amen. All right, would you all stand with me and we'll close the night in song. Slain now by grace. 
Your name indeed is holy, and for what you have done, for who you are, but for what you have done, you should be widely known. You should be universally praised. So Lord, help us to pray in such a way that we would foster your word going out, your fame being known to our neighborhoods, to our nation, and to the world. For your glory's sake, O oh Lord, bring this to pass in us, we pray in Jesus' name. Amen. <laughs> 